Women are over 50% of the U.S. population. How are we still talking about career discrimination and income equality and waiting on the ERA to be ratified by the states nearly 50 years later? Women make up only 12% of engineering jobs in Silicon Valley. We've been promising improvements and throwing around percentages in the Valley for 15 years, and what do we have to show for it? And it's not just about pay. We put up with a tremendous amount of crap in tech. As women in tech, we continue to be met with unique obstacles and challenges to overcome in order to advance our careers. I can say that statement to women, and I'll get nods. But because I'm a woman, for everyone else, I'll need to show some evidence and do a cartwheel to back up my argument. I've spent over 20 years of my career in online media and media-related startups. I got my start in photojournalism and then moved into digital publishing in the mid-90s. Free and open access to news and information is what fuels me, and I strongly believe that access to information should not be limited to those who can pay directly for it. Being able to leverage technology to expand and, and protect the impact of journalism is why I wake up every morning and go to work. At Quadcast, um, I, you know, I've, I've been lucky to find a company that embodies my passion for empowering publishers while also being a champion of, of women in tech. I'm proud to say that out of over 600 employees, 44% of Quadcasters are women and our leadership team is 50% female. Now, early in my career, I worked with several women at a digital media company. Uh, you know, in, in meetings, we were repeatedly talked over. You know, we had our ideas rejected only to hear the exact idea come from a male counterpart five minutes later, all to nods and applause. Um, you know, women were just assumed to be the staffers responsible for taking notes or doing all the execution work on projects. That sounds familiar, right? Well, after many months of enduring this behavior, um, the women in the office got together uh, in, this, in this small group of uh, technology and, and product folks uh, and formed a little club. So for our purposes, we're just going to call it the No Flight Club. But, you know, after hours of processing over after work therapy beverages, uh, we kind of we committed to joining together, um, supporting one another and to a simple set of tactics. What we agreed to do was this. So number one take turns politely pointing out the origin of an idea and redirect the credit to the woman who first said it. The second one was to support each other in assigning non-women owners to common meeting tasks. It was the, it was the equivalent of, you know, simultaneous fingers to no noses in a collective, not me. And the third one was to basically interrupt the interrupters, you know, actively make space for each other to speak and be heard, echoing each other to emphasize the ideas. Now, while these actions never fully changed all the behavior, uh, it did create awareness, awareness um, it got the necessary results, and most importantly, balanced the weight across our collective shoulders for the work required to constantly speak up, push back, and be seen. You know, in many ways, we have, um, we've come a long way since those days. Um, this was 20 plus years ago. Um, all the work, you know, the harassment training and the books and articles and conferences, you know, have, have made a positive impact. Um, and, and honestly, without the, the years of uh, groundwork, you know, awareness raising, building of allyships, and honestly, like raising our children to think differently and push back on social norms, you know, movements like, um, like Me Too, for example, might not have been able to gain the traction uh, that they have. You know, enough people were finally listening closely enough to hear the word enough. Uh, but there does seem to be a bit of a side effect as well. You know, along with the significant progress we've made to increase awareness and drive behavior change over the years has come somewhat of a handbook for walking right up to that line of serious, obvious bad behavior without crossing and being caught out. You know, as the, the more obvious bad behavior declines or, or goes into hiding in the workplace, I, I feel like it's, um, it's become more difficult to recognize uh, sexist behavior because it often comes in the form of microaggressions. Uh, it's a different kind of behavior, but from this same exact source, systemic sexism. Now, microaggressions are indirect, subtle, or unintentional discrimination against someone in a marginalized group, aka a uh, woman, just as one example. Um, the examples I outlined from earlier in my career are the things that are still going on, right? The, the meeting takeover move, the you know, we'll just rephrase your idea and make it my own trick. And the, she takes notes, okay? The assumption. 
Um, at one time or another, we've, we've probably all experienced some type of microaggression without even knowing it. And, and that's where the problem lies. The first step toward working to solve bad behavior is learning how to recognize it. And recognizing microaggressions is tough. But I, I rely, rely on a, a personal rule of thumb. When something happens and my first thought is, am I crazy? And I'm pretty darn sure I'm not crazy. Um, you know, that's my microaggression radar pinging. And then just to dig deeper and, you know, make sure I'm not actually crazy, I go to talk to others, women and men, uh, both, um, to share their experience and, uh, and get a gut check on it. Now, this, can appro this approach can serve as validation for your thoughts and give you the confidence to kind of take the next steps to, to deal with it. Recognizing bad behavior is the first step toward taking any action against it, right? First, do I have a problem? Yes, take a step. My mantra is act now and apologize later. This means be who you are without apology. Apologies are for when you actually do something wrong and being who you are and speaking your truth is, is not wrong. It's important for women in tech to speak their truth and not worry that they're gonna hurt people's feelings. Speaking your mind or asking for you know, what you rightly deserve is simply not being bitchy. One way you can be the change is by increasing awareness around bad behavior by calling it out when you see it. Another way is to give people, you know, coaching or constructive feedback after something has occurred to make sure that they're aware of the, their behavior. You know, pull them to the side and be like, hey, did you know that you did this? They may not even be aware how what they're doing impacts you and making them aware may help you both. Now I get some people, you know, may not feel comfortable with these first two approaches, which is why I find option three, which is what I did earlier in my career, um, so important. You know, join together, form your own club, your own support system, and come up with your own commitments to each other. You know, it's an effective way to be the change. What I've learned over the years is that if you wanna make any change within an industry as male dominated as the technology industry, you can't do it alone. And not only do you need to partner with other women, you also need allies. And by allies, I mean men, peers, leaders, others around you, um, you know, men who are open-minded, empathetic, uh, and want to see change as well. Having allies means that you have a support system within your organization or industry. And who doesn't want that, right? Together, you can collectively speak up, push back, and be seen. It's also important to have allies that hold different positions at the company. This enables you to create real change from the top down because it gets you a seat at the table where real change is made. Now, I'm incredibly lucky to have uh, an awesome ally boss. You know, not only is he like super wicked smart, but he's also incredibly empathetic, open-minded, and he honestly wants to affect real change. Um, his leadership team, you know, my peer group, uh, are of the same ilk, and together we proactively push forward progress. Quantcast is, is already a great place to work, but having my CTO's ear to discuss these issues and then having his mouth in the C-suite to advocate for different viewpoints that are specific to female technologists is critical. You know, finding a company that empowers women in tech is, is possible, right? You know, there's a few uh, key characteristics to companies um, that do empower women in the technology, technology field. You know, look for a company that values, you know, actively making an effort to hire women engineers and product managers and, and not just slightly increase percentages higher than the industry average. You know, often these stats are public. You know, if they're not, ask why. Look for a company that, uh, that provides real growth opportunities and that, you know, invest in their female employees. You know, how many women are in management positions? You know, dig through their LinkedIn page. And lastly, seek out a company that is self-aware and proactively checks in on fairness, on, on fairness by asking questions like, you know, is pay consistent and fair? Do we have a good balance of women and men in, in management positions? Are we calibrating performance on the same standards? You know, for this, you'll need to ask people who, who work there uh, or have worked there in the past. You know, just reach out and ask. You'll be surprised, you know, what people will share. Moving forward, regardless of where you are in your career, um, I encourage you to uh, not take crap from anybody because you fundamentally do not have to. You know, demand respect and equal treatment. Be yourself and do not apologize. You know, it's fair, it's feminism. That's what feminism means, right? Fairness. <laughs>